Being poor in spirit speaks of how we see ourselves. Being poor in spirit speaks of how we see ourselves. But then, mourning refers to how we feel about what we see. Okay? So being poor in spirit speaks of how we see ourselves. But mourning, blessed are those who mourn, refers to how we feel about what we see. It's one thing to see it. But you want to really understand the root of the heart behind what you see. Okay? And so when we see differently, then we're able to feel differently. This is very critical. And the result of seeing our great need is that we feel pain as we experience more of God's presence in our lives. So it's not enough just for me to see the issue. But there ought to be a response yeah. to what I see. So when I see injustice, there ought to be a response to what I see. When I see something that is out of alignment, out of whack, there ought to be a response to what I see. And that's why when people say things, they say, I didn't really mean that. No, you, you really need to be able to, to, to understand that there is something else going on. That's why we're really going to be shifting in 2017 for this house corporately in emotional health. Yes. We're going to be dealing with that very intentionally, very intensely. I'm already speaking and setting up things for next year because uh, there's a lot of things, and, and I'm, I'm afraid, and I've been saying this over and over and over again because I believe the Lord is really leading me with this. I'm afraid that we're using social media today to anesthetize our pain. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, there are things that we're sensing and feeling uh, that, we, that we keep so superficial. And that's why when you see these suicide rates jumping and all that, and you say to yourself, he just posted something nice yesterday. Are you with me? Yeah. But there is something else deeper going on that is not being expressed. And, and we try to surpass it and we try to churchify it and all that. But, but there are some other underlying things that must be dealt with. So that we can fully be whole in our relationship with God. Jesus said uh, in John 10 to 10, the thief come to steal, kill, and steal. But I come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Everybody say more abundantly. More abundantly. So if I'm going to live the more abundant life, then I have to be able to understand how to be poor in spirit. And I must also understand how to mourn for where I am so that I'm able to recognize where God wants me to be. Are you with me? Amen. Okay, and so it does not mean mourning just over difficult circumstances, but we are mourning for a spiritual breakthrough. Number one, three types of mourning I want to look at. Number one, mourning over self. Mourning over self. <clears throat> mourning over self. Mourning over self. Mourning is often involved in the salvation of experience. When a person is under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to say it again. When a person is under Kaya, the conviction of the Holy Spirit, not under the conviction of another individual. And too many times we try to bring self-conviction. But it's the work of the Holy Spirit to convert, to convict, and to condemn. Uh, that's why no matter how much you wish you could or how much you pray you could, you can't change someone. <coughs> It is only the work of the Holy Spirit that can change an individual. Are you with me? Okay, so when a person is under the conviction of the Holy Spirit for salvation, it is a natural response to mourn before God because of your sin. The comfort of that kind of mourning comes when someone discovers the beauty of what Christ has done for them. Amen. And as a result, by claiming and receiving him as Savior, there is a forgiveness. That's why we understand that we come to the throne of grace boldly so that we're able to find help in time of need. Why? Because I understand I can't do this. I need him to carry it. Okay? And so uh, we understand that that is very important for us when it comes to mourning over ourselves because Jesus died so that we have access to eternal life and therefore we receive the inheritance of who he is. It is in Psalm 51 we begin to find the classic case of David mourning over himself. When he was convicted over sin, he mourned. 
David was totally honest with God about what he had done. He gave no excuses. He blamed nobody else. He took full responsibility. And when we mourn over ourselves, we will do the same thing. We are totally honest, and then we are able to name the specific areas of our shortcomings. And that brings us to being sorry over what we have done. See, see, see this, this, this is what's, what's challenging me today. What's challenging me today is that we're living in a day in which we no longer really recognize or understand conscious. Yeah. Or being conscious of something. And, and see, when you can casually just get up and say whatever you want with no accountability, uh, it's a very dangerous place. Amen. Because there ought to be a godly sorrow yeah. that comes out of your life. <laughs> And it's not just because you got caught. Yeah. Yes. Are you with me today? Yes. But it's understanding that out of what my actions caused, there was something, there was a breach in my relationship that caused me to recognize where I messed up. And now, Lord, please, I, I, I come to you because I understand I need you yes. to continue to yes. work through me. Yes. How many of you will admit that you're a work in progress? Amen. Hallelujah. And, and, and so understanding, mourning over self, mourning over self, with confession comes the comfort of forgiveness. With confession comes the comfort of forgiveness. Turn to 1 John and 1 and 9. It's very important. Uh, 1 John 1 and 9. One of the scriptures I had to memorize as a kid. 1 John 1 and 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. I know it's not popular to preach about sin. I'm sorry, but I, 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 I did. We confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So how do we handle mourning over self? How do we handle mourning over sin as believers? First, first we must confess any known sin to God that we have not dealt with before. Uh, one of my spiritual fathers, and I talk about him a lot, Dr. Mark Schroner, talks about, uh, he's very good with dream interpretation. People always reach out to me, <clears throat> and I don't mind it, uh, about dream interpretation. But one thing he's taught me uh, is that whenever you know they have a dream about something, uh, oftentimes someone say, oh, I had a dream about you. I dream about you. And I'm not saying that every dream isn't prophetic, but sometimes people go overboard with this stuff. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, the first thing he'll say to you is, okay, what about me? talk to him and he said well you know uh, that dream wasn't about me that dream was about you he said what he said uh there is something going on in you that the holy spirit is trying to awaken you to that he can't do when you're conscious so he has to disturb you unconsciously to bring an awakening and a lot of times <clears throat> when there are areas in our life that we don't want to address he has to begin to use different means to cause an awakening for transformation. Are you with me? Okay, and so first we must confess <clears throat> any known sin to God that we have not dealt with before. Second, we must set time to examine our lives daily. Yes. Daily. 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 And, and so for some, that might be the first thing in the morning. For others, it might be the last thing at night. But constantly spending time with God, examining yourself. Lord, you know, today when I was on my way, I stopped inside the Starbucks and this man said something to me. You know what I said? I need you to help me. Practical. You understand? Or have you ever? All right. So let's, let's take it a step deeper. Someone cut you off as you're driving. And, and you, gave them, you gave them the sign language. You know what the sign language is? Hallelujah. <laughs> and, you need, and you need the Lord to help you. Are you with me? Okay, and, 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 and so, so being able to, is that clear? Okay, and, and so understanding that it, it happens, it happens, trust me. All right. Uh, set, thirdly, thirdly, if we need help knowing what God considers sin, we must be able to refer to the scriptures. A good list is in Colossians 3, 5 through 10. It's very clear because today people sometimes ask, well, what is that? What does that mean? Is that really, does that really still affect today? You know, the questions today are something unbelievable. You know, um, Colossians chapter 3. 
Colossians chapter 3. I knew I wouldn't get no shot when I started preaching myself. It's okay. Colossians chapter 3. All right. And look at, at verse 5. Okay. <clears throat> well, let's, let's start with verse 1. If then you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you have died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ is who our life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Now notice verse number five. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil, desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. In which you yourself once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are put off to all these things. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Uh, since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Very clear. Very clear. Okay. Another good example of this <clears throat> to really understand is Proverbs 6. Proverbs 6. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. This is what the Lord told me to give you today. So I'm just a mailman. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. <coughs> These things the Lord hates. Oh, wow. I, I just thought God just loved. Hold it. These things the Lord hates. And seven are an abomination to him. A proud look. A lying tongue. Has that shed innocent blood. Has that shed innocent blood. Okay. A heart that devises wicked plans. Are you here? Yes. Feet that are swift and running to do evil. A false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among the brethren. That's why you have to be very careful with talebearers. People that come to you about somebody else because they'll come about somebody else to you. Okay? And, and so we have to understand and understanding and recognizing that we need God to help us through these things. Are you with me? Okay? And so that means I have to confess this stuff dead. Lord, you know, I, you, you, you know me. You know me. He knows, he knows, all right? And, and so understand that. Finally, we must be aware of delaying the mourning process. Sometimes we are just too comfortable in our sins. And enjoying our sins too much to actually mourn over them. Look at somebody tell them, this is your vegetable today. This is your vegetable. Hallelujah. This is your vegetable today, okay? As Christians, we are to look to the cross and to remind ourselves of how Jesus has suffered for us. And that is our motivation and our strength for us to quit what we are doing for his sake. And that's why uh, uh, when it comes to this today, we, we don't see conviction power in the church because when well, I'll tell you one thing, if we get back to preaching God, we'll see the power of God. Yeah, I'll say it again. If we go back to preaching God, we'll see the power of God. And too many times today, you're hearing a lot of success and motivation. Yeah. And, 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 and moral deism, as Dr. DeCaro calls it, just down, moral deism in our pulpits in which, you know, we just want to encourage you and strengthen you and, and send you out. All right. But, but that's why we have habits today we can't break. Yeah. And we're struggling and folks are struggling and they're posting, but they're struggling and they're struggling and they're struggling. And the Lord spoke to me this week. He said, if, if you pray more than you post, that's a problem. Mm, yeah. and, and so understanding understand that my relationship with God there ought to be a transformation 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 you know my, my dream and my desire when people say years from now oh I go to world final oh you do you know you do oh I, I couldn't tell you know, I, I want there ought to be a transformation there ought to be a transformation. When, when they look at you, I don't care what you got on, it doesn't make difference how you look, but there ought to be a change on the inside of you. And, and, and so we, we have to understand uh, that the work of the Holy Spirit changes and transforms our nature. Are you with me? So mourning over self, number two, mourning over saints. Mourning over saints. I'm going to deal with this today, and I'm, I'm good with time. I'm looking and paying attention. Okay, mourning over saints. I want to address the critical spirit. The Holy Spirit gave me this. I want to address the critical spirit. There is a difference between being critical of the saints and mourning over the sin of the saints. Okay? There's a difference between being critical of saints and mourning over the sins 
of the saints. Now, uh, when I talk about saints, all right, understanding that uh, as a believer in Christ, <laughs> yes, you may be considered saved by grace, but now you are part of the body of Christ. Therefore, you are, years ago, we used to call them saints, okay? So when a person is critical, hear this, he or she is not concerned about the spiritual well-being of the person involved. When a person is critical, they are not sorrowed over the sin. When a person is critical, they are making themselves feel good yeah. by pointing out what's wrong in another person. When a person is critical, they think of themselves better than the other person. So the question now is, how is mourning over sin of the saints different from criticism of the saints? Uh, you are seriously concerned, when you are seriously concerned about the holiness of God and don't want to see anyone, especially yourself, sin against him. It starts, first of all, with your relationship with God. Okay. Also, we understand that we have to be concerned about the spiritual well-being of the person. Wanting to see them restored to God. And that results in us talking to God in concerned prayer about the individuals. And then we have to ask God to deliver them from their sin. And that bursts compassion in you. That bursts compassion in you. That bursts compassion in you. Uh, um, and, and the Holy Spirit will begin to even burden you to intercede for individuals and challenges and all kinds of stuff. Uh, uh, because uh, it then causes you to talk to those involved about their challenges, their sins, their issues, instead of talking to others. And too many times a day, we spend too much time going back and forth with other people. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. Okay, and, and, and really to spend more time seeking the face of God. Okay, so mourning over self. Number two, mourning over saints. Number three, mourning over sinners. Understanding sinners, those without the Savior. Those who do not understand the Lord Jesus Christ and have not received him in the forgiveness of this sin, receiving everlasting life. We have a responsibility. We have a responsibility. It's amazing that because whenever you, you look at ministries and churches and the body of Christ as a whole, you know, today everybody wants to be something. You know, so I'm going to be a prophet. I'm going to be this, I'm going to be that. You know, but you don't really hear much about the work of the ministry of the evangelist. Right. And, and understanding having a burden and a passion for souls. You know, we got all these hashtags, but all souls do matter. Amen. Okay. Amen. And, and so understanding that we should mourn for those we know in our lives who do not have Christ. Amen. We must mourn for those we know without Christ. Whether they're on your job, whether they're around you, wherever they are. Now that that's not what I'm not saying you gotta get up on the train and you know, I'm not saying all that. I'm not saying all that because quite honestly, that's that that God does use that. I'm not saying he doesn't. You know, but when I'm sitting there, I wanna read my books, so I can go on Amen. what I'm doing. All right. You know, I'm just being honest with you. Now some people, the Lord, I've seen God really use people to do that. But what I am saying to you is is that there ought to be a compassion and a burden. I really believe that one of the most effective ways to really begin to minister to the Lord, to evangelize, is really, first of all, developing a relationship with a person. Jesus, in John 4, initiated conversation before conversion. Yeah, that's good. And oftentimes, we want to initiate conversion without a conversation. Jesus comes to the woman with a uh, uh, bottle well and he begins to speak to her. And he first begins to initiate conversation and begins to communicate with her. And as a result of that, we then see a transformation. So that means that if we really want to be effective, uh, uh, it should be, first of all, we are investing in the relationship. And as a result of us investing in the relationship, then we can invite them to an opportunity. So I, I really believe that it is much more effective. Someone, I would be more open to understand you or to listen to you if you first sought to learn and understand me. 
You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and too many times it's like, you know, we want to we want to stuff it down their throat. Lord, I told them they don't want to see you. Here, take this paper. They don't want to see you. Just stuff it down. All right, without understanding it. Because because you'd be surprised how many people are really open. But they have so many things going on. So many things. Do you know how people are hurting today? That's yeah. true. Do you know how many people are struggling today? Yeah. Trying to comprehend. One day, Pastor and I were going to get some um, some milk from Babies R Us. And, and man, that stuff's expensive. And, and we were going to get some, because the son could only take a certain kind of milk. So we were going in there to get some. And we get ready to walk out. And we do it all the time. So we get ready to walk out. And, uh, and he looked at her. We looked at the lady. He said, uh, your daughter loves you. She just kept looking. And so she, I guess she tried to, you know, try to ignore us. And he said, he said, your daughter loves you. And so we, we get ready to get started. Oh. And so she's up there, start, start tearing up. I, we, we didn't go into, do you know Gina? We started ministering to her. Yeah. Yeah. And all of a sudden, her heart began to open. Began to open. Why? Because there was somebody who was able to see that inside of her was a need. Yeah. Are you with me? Years ago, we said so. He he looked beyond my faults, and and he saw my somebody you know is in need of who you serve. Yeah. Look for the need. Look for the need. Look for the need. So we are to mourn for those we know without Christ. And there is a great. <clears throat> Passage that reminds us to mourn over those who do not know the Lord, even in the Old Testament, Psalm 126, 5 to 6. Those that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goes forth and weeps because precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. When we sorrow before God over the people we know without Christ and pray for them in mourning, when we go to them, bringing the precious message of salvation, really seeking to minister to them, to understand them, we can expect there'll be times when we see those we pray for, and then we'll see them witness in that moment. There'll be times you'll be praying, sometimes you'll be ministering, praying for people for years, and you'll never see some sort of transformation stuff, but you have no idea the impact that you make. Yeah. You have no idea. Sometimes it's not until some of us literally close our eyes and, and, and are with the Lord that you begin. You, you have no idea the kind of impact you make uh, on someone's life. You sometimes have no idea what a smile can do. That's true. You have no idea what a hug can do. Some people, they, they, they wish that there was somebody that could just show them some love. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. And, and so understanding, blessed, are those for they shall be comforted. As I close, godly sorrow or mourning is a supernatural work of the Spirit that will lead you to deliverance from a dull spirit and a powerless life. This mourning is God's gift to us. The gift of mourning is rare, precious, and powerful. Rare, precious, and powerful. And it cannot be bought with gold. And therefore, and I want to challenge us in this house, therefore, we must be ref we must refuse to be comforted by anything except the fullness of the promises of the Word of God. Either you're going to be filled with the Spirit of God or you're going to be full of yourself. That's right. And understanding that 2 Corinthians 7 and 9 says, Godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation. What diligence it produced in you, what indignation, what fear of God, what desire, what vindication. We must continually be aware of who we are in Christ and what we are experiencing in God. While at the same time growing in our awareness of how much more there is to experience. I'll say that again. We must continually be aware of who we are in Christ 
and what we are experiencing in God while at the same time growing in our awareness of how much more there is to experience.